Welcome to Mamas in Spirit, a podcast pointing you towards God in everything you are and everything you do. I'm Lindy Wynn, and it's a blessing to be with you. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the season four of Mamas in Spirit, our Lenten season. We are incredibly blessed to be here with our chaplain, Father John Meyer. Father John, thank you so much for joining us. Happy Lent to all you listeners out there. I hope it has been fruitful so far. And as always, it is a blessing to continue this journey with you all. I know uh, my prayers and intentions are with you, especially especially for those of you who are seeking a more intimate relationship with the Lord, uh, perhaps diving in a little deeper in faith, uh, seeking healing, forgiveness, renewal, uh, whatever it is, wherever you find yourself, just know I am praying for you. Yes. And you too, Lindy. Thank you, Father John. And I am praying for you and for all of us. And it gives great consolation to know that we have your prayers, Father John. And I love how you already said it is a blessing to be on this journey with you because it's so important for Father John and I to know that we're on this journey together, on this journey into the sacred heart of Jesus in our personal relationships with God. We are learning and we are growing too. And I think probably the biggest thing that Father John and I learn over and over again is our complete and utter dependence on God. Yeah, that is a definite true statement. And uh, just as we were preparing for this podcast, experiencing some technical difficulties and never quite sure what to expect when we uh, record together. But there's a beauty in that uh, insofar as it places us as really God desires. Uh, of course, he sees us as his children and it is our our responsibility, I would say, uh, to enter into that identity as his children, although uh, it is difficult with responsibilities and worries and preoccupations and, you know, even the, the human uh, sense of, of anxiety and nervousness. Um, I mean, it, that's something you've experienced, I would imagine, Lindy, you know, doing all these rep- podcasts. I certainly experienced it before Mass. You know, if I know I'm going to um, preach and, of course, as a minister, uh, trying to bring the Word of God into the lives of people, uh, but it's so can be challenging when my own insecurities or my own fear of, you know, am I going to say the right thing? Uh, is it going to touch people? And it's so easy to, I think, psych ourselves out so that we sort of become our own obstacles to enter into that childlike relationship with the Lord. Uh, anyway, I just, I perhaps present that to you as, <laughs> as an opening, opening questions. So we're going from zero to 50 really quick. <laughs> Hey, that's how Mamas in Spirit rolls. And actually, it reminds me, I interviewed Meg Hunter-Kilmer at the end of the last season three. And I remember her talking about Mary's ongoing yeses, that we focus so much on her big yeses in her life. But yet, there's these ongoing yeses. And yes, yes, Father John, yes, this takes courage the great mercy and blessing and grace of the Lord to always continue forward because we choose or it's placed on my heart, on your heart to delve into really big topics that feel like they really matter because, you know, we've chosen a really lighthearted one for today. We've chosen shame. (laughs) Why not talk about shame? Why not? Let's, yeah, (laughs) we're going there. We're going there. Amen. So in that spirit, in the Holy Spirit, would you like to open in prayer? Would you like me to? I am happy to open in prayer. Wonderful. Invite the Holy Spirit wherever you are, trusting that God's presence is with us both as community, but also in our own individual lives to invite him into this special season of Lent. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, you sent us your Son who demonstrated what it means to be emptied, poured out, not out of necessity, but in his own pouring out and emptiness, transformed and redeemed our fallenness. And he came for us a model of how to be empty before you so that we might be filled with your grace and your love. And so we ask that you come and we invite you in 
to all those places of our lives that need that emptiness, that we might divulge and offer to you all that is not of you, and in receiving your mercy, your forgiveness, be filled with that new life, that new wine, that faith that ever transforms us and draws us deeper into your love and your presence. As always, we ask this through the prayers of our saints, especially our blessed Mother Mary. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Thank and you. And through the prayers. Oh, you're welcome. I was going to say, and also, also through the prayers of our patroness as well, who I don't ask to pray for me often enough, um, but we're very grateful to uh, have a intercessor for us in this ministry of Mamas in Spirit, which I don't know if you've talked about that very much, Lindy, if you want to mention that real quick. Well, the first podcast that I ever recorded, not the first one that was released, it was season one, episode 10. It was the first podcast of Lent, the first season, was with a beloved sister in Christ and dear friend, Carolyn Henry Dreffel. And I think that that podcast completely encapsulates where God calls us to be and where God calls me to be and the spirit of Mamas in Spirit because I recorded on my knees holding her hands as she laid on her bed entering hospice and she passed away two days later. So by the grace and goodness of God, the generosity of others like Brenda Argano, thank you sister, we were able to capture this glorious woman of faith. She is the most faithful example, the most faithful woman I've ever known. She helped create the Adoration Chapel with 24 hour adoration at the parish that Father John and I met at, and the one that you grew up at in Redondo Beach, California. And just a woman who completely surrendered her life to the Lord and passed away just shy of 60. Completely peaceful graceful and centered in the love of the Lord. Yeah. And that's a beautiful image you give us of you kneeling before her. Uh, not of course in, uh, in worship, but really in prayer is that I think the podcast for those of you who haven't listened to it really is, it's an entire prayer, that podcast. Um, and I mention her especially because as we enter into this dialogue on shame, God knows that, that is something that no human person other than uh, Mary and Jesus were spared of. And our saints are those who have allowed Christ to conquer shame in their life, that they may not let uh, whatever insecurity, whatever weakness, whatever sin define them or be that uh, upper hand in their life. But despite all those uh whatever story, whatever history that they had, uh, kept their eyes focused on Christ. And so uh, Carolyn was someone who did that as well. And so we just ask that she might pray for us, that uh, even for us weak human beings as we are, we might also not be afraid to let God in, that he might have the upper hand in our life. Yes. Thank you for that, Father John. And it just reminds me of how God transforms everything and everyone because to witness her who she, Carolyn lived a fully human life with all the highs and lows, like all of us do all the different feelings, all the different questions, all the different experiences. She completely abandoned herself to the Lord and to be able to witness the purity of her heart and soul as she went home to the Lord is a great model and testimony for all of us. And it's so important for us to remember that we are on this journey together, hand in hand, knit together, and that God graces all of us, including Father John, including me, with examples both living and those who have passed, like the saints that you've talked about, and of course, the ultimate model in Christ and our beloved Mother Mary of how how to do this and who to follow. Right. And I, I do pray that everybody who's listening, when we speak of not just Carolyn, but just that idea of, of surrender and 
entering into that childlike identity with the Lord, that there is someone that comes to mind. I mean, even if it is uh, a child, I know in my own life, looking and witnessing my nieces and nephews now as they get a little older, but still have that true, innocent joy and purity about them, that there is so much I'm learning as they ask questions or as they explore, as they live their life. Uh, but even on a, a more mature end, people like Carolyn, who I was blessed to know, and then I obviously think of my, my own mother, who is now with the Lord, um, have provided that more tangible reality and perseverance that in the midst of all the uncertainties of life and the different voices that speak to us, that these are real witnesses, real people who chose not only not to listen to them, but bringing those voices, those lies to the Lord and allowing the Lord to, to redeem. And what I mean by redeem is not necessarily that they forget or they lose those memories, but that they are given sort of a new outlook, a new lens. And that's, isn't that what Easter is all about? That's what, that's why Lent exists, that we're getting ready for that birth to new life. Uh, and of course, for those in the RCIA, that birth is particularly real. And for the rest of us, it's a renewal, a reminder of what we've already been given in our baptism. Amen. And I would love for you to talk about Father John. You used two words that really struck me. The first one was lies. And then the other is a new vision, a new perception in the Lord. Could you please share with us about shame? Because just so everybody knows, Father John has researched and studied shame and prayed with the concept of shame much more than me. I could share my personal experiences or those that I've heard from others, but not really. I, I'm no expert on shame. Yeah, so... It I did write my, uh, or I shouldn't say it wasn't necessarily on shame, but I included in my master's thesis in the seminary, which was a uh, an investigation on J Pope John St. John Paul II's theology of the body, and shame is a important theme that he uh, dives into and explores because it is part of the human experience. It is part of uh, not just our fallenness, but is a reality that constantly can bite away at us and something to which we are not totally free of until we arrive in heaven. So uh, perhaps just to to give a bit of an image. Um, so I live uh, in Rome with in a house of, of about 60 priests and all these priests are students uh, from all over the United States. We have a couple guys from Australia as well. And as you can imagine, uh, this is a both a diverse, a pretty diverse group, but also uh, an, a very gifted group of men. And I'm very blessed that their gifts have challenged me to push myself and to enter into with the Lord those weaknesses that I continue to struggle with. Uh, as you can imagine, though, as well, that since we're all studying and we're studying different things, a lot of us, but. Uh, I mean, just to, to put it bluntly, like there's competition and it's not something that usually gets talked about, but it's something that all of us experience intention in. And, you know, at any, on any given day, not that it happens all the time, but when I'm in conversation, let's say at, at the lunch table with other guys and they start sharing what they're studying or what they know or what their experiences are, there's that that anxiety that starts welling up in me and that anxiety usually takes some form of, of like jealousy, right? That there's something that I hear from another priest that I feel like I don't have and that I want. So it's not just jealousy. It's also envy. And the question is, well, why, why is there this experience, this tension when this brother of mine who is presumably doing God's will and trying to follow the Lord as he is called to, uh, is there's now this rupture in our relationship, this dent that happens. And on the surface, we can first say that 
in that jealousy and that envy, there is guilt, right? I mean, those are sinful um, and not that it manifests itself in some kind of like, I'm not going to talk to you again. I'm going to give you the cold shoulder. But even interiorly, if we start entertaining thoughts, if I start saying to myself, well, I'm, uh, I'm not, you know, worth as much as that guy because he seems to know more than I do. And so it goes from the level of guilt to something much deeper. It goes and hits into my, my very identity, uh, the very sense of, uh, who I am and whether I can contribute anything at all. And, you know, depending on my fatigue, my stress, there's certainly di different levels of, uh, that in, in which those circumstances, those encounters affect me. But the point is, is that whether it is, uh, that sense of, of envy, wanting something that we don't have, like a covetousness, um, to use language from the 10 commandments, um, whether it uh, might have to do not so much with jealousy or envy, but uh, maybe our, our body image. Uh, we look at somebody that just looks better than we do, and we want that. Uh, maybe it has to do with success, um, which plays into jealousy, but maybe sometimes in a, in a different way. Uh, or we have those doubts, like, am I doing really what's, what God is calling me to? All these things... All these things boil down to the experience of shame. And so um, I mentioned lies because, uh, and as I said, John Paul II especially goes into this in, in the theology of the body, is the very root of shame is ultimately a lie. And and scripturally, he, he points to uh, the book of Genesis in chapter 3, which we all know the story of Adam and Eve encountering the serpent and the serpent approaches Eve and the, they're told not to eat this fruit, but the serpent says, uh, well, if you eat this fruit, you know, you will become like gods. You will know the truth. Um, and in that moment, um, we understand that Eve is now beginning to doubt because God was the one. God was the one that told her not to eat that fruit. And why would God do that? Did God want to just torture Adam and Eve? No. There was a protection there. There was a wisdom, uh, a right relationship where God did this out of, out of love. And of course, I'm not trying to interpret this necessarily historically, but this is... Uh, revealing to us a, a deeper truth about who we are because when Adam and Eve chose to eat of that fruit, their choice was a, first of all, a rejection of God. It was a pride. And in rejecting God, they, as the serpent said, were trying to make themselves God. And ever since then, uh, we have been f suffering the consequences of that. We have been suffering from, that uh, even if it's sometimes minute and doesn't always bother us, a, a division that in this life we are always going to be incomplete. And uh, what I thought we can reflect upon in our time together is becoming aware, first of all, of that incompleteness in ourself. And then second of all, how do we react or respond to that? Because... As I said, whether it's jealousy or issues with body image, I mean, every sin um, is affected by and affects our experience of shame. Lindy, I think your microphone is off or I see it muted. There was chaos behind me. <laughs> I want to make sure that I and we completely understand shame in this sense. So is shame something that we experience, which is a lie and a falsity at the heart of who we are as a person, a way that I perceive myself that is not of God? So on the one hand, 
we have to understand shame as often a partial truth, right? Because let's say, for example, going back to um, the experience of jealousy over for a brother priest and wanting maybe a certain gift that he has, and then that becoming on a deeper level that uh, that sense of value. So on the surface, maybe it's true. Maybe this um, priest that I'm jealous of does, objectively speaking, know more than I do. However, when it comes to that that value, that doubt in our our worth, that is where the lies particularly present, uh, because being made in the image of God and God being uh, omnipotent, meaning that you know He's He is everywhere, all powerful, um, that He does not distinguish in love between this person or that person. That each of us is created intentionally in his image and likeness. And we would not exist without his intending it. Um, and I know, especially in our culture today, that can so easily be confused when, I don't know, you hear about, uh, you know, well, this child wasn't supposed to be born or that they were a mistake or a surprise or something like that. And I think that comes from our own sense uh, our own narrowness of of life uh, that we are we try still to be like God to be gods and we're terrible at it right because if we look around our world today what do we see um, poverty division uh, war uh, abortion uh, you name it and all these all these sins have at their root this pride over trying to overstep our boundaries of trying to becoming of, of attempting to becoming someone that we're not and saint john paul ii uses this word grasping that in shame rather than receiving as gift that we try to grasp at life at power because of that doubt because if if i don't feel like i'm i'm worth something then I grasp at, let's say, fashion. Well, this makes me feel good because I, I look, I, when I look good, then I feel better about myself. Or um, it gives us the excuse to perhaps lie or uh, manipulate because uh, if I am ahead of that person uh, or if I put that person down, I feel better about myself. But it's ultimately underlying all that is this lie that, first of all, we have to fight for our value. Um, our value is intrinsic. It is unconditional. And that's the truth that Jesus came to bring to us and to restore to us. And yet, even in our baptism, we still struggle with accepting it. Yes, with accepting God's merciful love. You talked a little bit about us earning God's love or earning love. How do you see that playing out even within the context of faith in our church? Because some of the things that I, I witness and that I see and that I've even seen and witnessed within myself is that earning of God's love or the earning of heaven, the earning of eternal life, when really that is a gift and a grace that is only given by God. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this isn't anything new. Uh, the church has over time on and off confronted uh, heresies in in movements where the basic thought was uh, that we could earn, earn our way to heaven, that um, God's grace is helpful, but it's not necessary. Um, and then there's also the opposite extreme, too, that we can't do anything good, that we're just uh, a ball of, of useless matter, that without God, we're deprived. Um, rather, there's uh, there's a mean in that where the truth lies, that God, as we also hear in Genesis, made us good. And when uh, the Adam, when Adam and Eve fell, uh, when we talk about the fall, um, we don't lose our natural goodness, uh, but it does get um, affected. It does become uh, infected, I, I would even say infected by this uh, experience of shame. And so um, 
What was your question again? <laughs> yes, my my question is about the earning of oh, that's right, God's love or the earning of value that I'm I am therefore valuable because I can somehow earn this by being virtuous enough or good enough, faithful enough, pious enough, obedient enough. So, so when we face that question of am I good enough? Can I do enough to earn God's love? Uh, that question is, uh, no, we can't. There is nothing we can do that is going to change God's love toward us, first of all, because God doesn't change. Um, but second of all, because love is not dependent on the worth or the value or the actions of the person. God's love, as I said, is is unconditional, and it goes much deeper than what we perceive as, uh, let's say, a worldly love that, you're right, does often judge people based on what they can do on their performance, and insofar as they can do something, they're valued. Um, but that's part of our challenge is to enter into, because I'm not going to say here that we can just wipe it away or wish it away. Um, if any of us experiences, you know, that jealousy or um, different uh, struggles with accepting who we are. Those things uh, require time and healing, and it often points to an experience. I mean, it's not like these things just come out of thin air. Uh, and maybe the experience is something that we know, um, like an experience of rejection an experience of judgment, an experience of failure. It could be an experience of abuse, uh, an experience where, whether it's in childhood, uh, in um, adolescence, in adulthood, uh, that certain experiences make us shift who we believe that we are. And... God wants to kind of take that, that twisting of our identity and untwist it. He wants us to be able to see to see ourselves as he sees us. Um, and isn't that what we hear in the first letter of St. John? You know, for we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Um, and, and that is our hope. And it's a hope that gets fulfilled in heaven. But our call as Christians, as Catholics, right now, especially in this time of Lent, is to take seriously and not to hide or to run away from those experiences of shame because they color the lens from which we see the world. And so, therefore, they can limit our capacity to love. They limit our freedom. And even if, um, you know, for example, and I know this is a, a sensitive issue, uh, and so when I say this, I'm not extending any sort of judgment, but rather having uh, had the blessing, really, of, of ministering to women uh, who have had abortion. And when they, uh, and I'm not, you know, breaking any kind of seal of confession because this is happening outside of that context, but if they have come to me, Asking like how to, you know, they've confessed this many times and it's still clinging to them. It's still something that, that weighs them down. Um, they have fallen into what John Paul II has called a, a uh, an attitude of con condemnation. Um, that is the shame speaking. And Christ wants to set us free from that weight, from that condemnation. And... Jesus calls us, um, calls us to be freed from that, but it's not it's not magic. It's not something that uh, we can simply wish. It requires a first of all, I'd say the first thing it requires is an openness and an invitation for the Holy Spirit to come in um, and to help us look at those experiences that have affected us so deeply. Um, I Secondly, I would say it probably also requires some kind of accompaniment that God, as we hear again in Genesis, it is not good for the man to be alone. And what 
part of the crisis that we're experiencing, let's say, especially in the family, is when you have a husband and wife who can't talk to each other about their shame. Um, and maybe that shame is toward the other, and maybe there's resentment that's formed over things like that. But these experiences, if we become aware of them, should not become obstacles that we just say, well, it is what it is, or um, I, that this is too painful for me to look at. But that might be true. And God, of course, walks with us. He knows us, and he's not there to force us into it. But in his lovingness, uh, in his gentleness, in a way that he can, he can and I can't as a human being, because I get impatient, and I wish... I wish myself would change quicker, and it doesn't happen. But God, in, in his benevolence, can walk with us in such a way so that whatever shame that we're carrying, whatever thing that might make us think we have to grasp or we have to earn our love, that he wants to, to heal us so that we become docile and become those children that we were talking about earlier, that we, when we look at and think of Carolyn Henry, and when we think about, you know, our, my mom and the saints, that they truly encompassed and embraced as best as they could that childlike identity that wasn't grounded in shame, but in true freedom. Yes, I love how you talk about true freedom, because that's exactly what I witnessed and the freedom of joy and goodness and pouring about on others, because you talked about how our shame can keep us from loving others. And so the how essential it is for us to bring ourselves out fully to the Lord and to bring all of our shame to the Lord to be healed. So also so that we can pour out upon others, because I, I think it was a line that I read in walking with pur purpose. It's a, a Bible study with Lisa. I think you say her last name, Brennick Meyer. And she talks about how, if we don't heal our shame, it gets transferred onto other people and onto other relationships, but that God loves us so fully and completely and that we are daughters, daughters and sons of a God who loves us beyond our own imagination. God wants to heal us and heal us completely so that we can return to that childlike freedom and innocence and purity of heart and, and soul and mind in the Lord. And I want to share a recent experience with everybody that I had because I think that it really touches upon this because I think that sometimes that I can very much be a person who tries to earn God's love or who tries to control things around me in ways that I don't even comprehend so that they're pretty for the Lord or that they're good for the Lord. But sometimes like Father John, you and I talked about, there are these moments that we have in our lives that remind us of our complete dependence on the Lord and that we ha we're called to completely abandon ourselves to the Lord. So recently over this last Christmas break here, I had these expectations that I was going to go into this break and that it was going to be a break in mamas and spirit. And it was going to be retreat. Like my youngest would go back to school and I would spend all this time in silent prayer that I would walk the local trails and I would just be poured out upon by the Lord. And I don't even know that I completely realized that I had these expectations, but I did. Long story short, our littlest unexpectedly coming off of the flu and other things had breathing problems. And these breathing problems really frightened me. And they even really frightened me one specific night in the middle of the night. And for all of you out there who are mothers or who just love other children so completely and so dearly, we can all imagine those moments where we feel completely vulnerable and are, we're facing our fears because I love my daughter beyond articulation and the thought of losing her strikes my heart with fear. And yes, I'm so sorry to say that that is the extreme that I went to, of course, in some way that touched on that fear, some way deep in, in my heart and soul in the middle of the night. So after looking things up and realizing that her breath rate was normal. So even though I was hearing all these other crazy things that I probably didn't need to take her to the emergency room in the middle of the night, I laid in her bed next to her and I felt frozen or paralyzed in that fear 
that fear of, of what was going to unfold. And praise God, God poured out on me so beautifully and so completely in such a surprising way. She has these stars on the ceiling in her room, and they remind me of being in Mary's mantle. They remind me of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And I just felt so consoled looking up at these stars, these glow in the dark stars on her ceiling and the Lord covering me in the Lord's mercy and the Lord's goodness. And the other thing in her room is a glow in the dark Mary, a little statue that a beautiful woman, April Mascola, her daughter had it and she shared it with mine. And I felt the real presence of Mary in that moment through that little glow in the dark Mary and these stars on the ceiling and knowing that I could have fallen to a place of shame. Like here I am, I'm in ministry. I love the Lord with all my heart and soul. Um, I shouldn't be feeling this way. I shouldn't feel paralyzed. I shouldn't feel overwhelmed by all of this. Like I know where to go. I think when I was younger, I would have felt really ashamed about that. And that would have touched upon a part of me that felt like I wasn't good enough or didn't have it together enough. But instead, I allowed myself to lay there as God's beloved daughter and for the Lord to pour out upon me and to just love me as I am and to bask and to soak in his glorious love and just to allow his mercy to be upon me. And I bring that story up because that's something that I hope and I pray for, for all of us, whether it has to do father, John, you brought up this example of abortion. There's a million examples. There's a, I'm a woman. There's a million examples of a feeling insecure or not good enough. I hear from moms all the time who pinpoint certain moments in their lives where they feel like they failed. Maybe they yelled at their children. Maybe they were late to mass with their children, whatever it is that somehow those tiny little moments touch on shame of not being good enough. But like Christine Rich said way back in season two, it's not about being good enough. It's that you're already more than enough. We are already more than enough because God shaped and molded and crafted each one of us. And this morning when I was pondering this and praying for this, this beautiful thought came to mind for me. God loved us so much that God thought of us. God imagined us. The sacredness of life comes before conception. It's that we were thought of, that we were dreamt of, that we were imagined, and that there's nothing that we can do that God cannot heal. And that's why we're doing this. That's why we're talking about shame in this Latin podcast, because so many moments of our day, And this will happen and does happen to every single one of us. Tiny moments can have profound effects on our sense of shame, of not being good enough, of not being holy enough. But Father and John and I have talked about this. I can only earn so much of God's love. I can only become so patient. I can only become so obedient. I can only become so much of all these things. I will never be perfect. So in that last final moment of my life, I am going to be fully dependent on the merciful love of the Lord. It's not that I shouldn't have my heart and my soul completely fixated on Christ and completely abandon my life to God and try with my heart and soul to grow closer to the Lord, to become more like the Lord. All of those things are so important. I just, at the end of the day, I know for myself that I am going to be completely dependent on the same merciful, glorious, full love, complete love that is beyond my human understanding that I was created in, in that first moment I was thought of. That same love is what is going to surround and accompany me, encompass me, hopefully and prayerfully in the last moment of my love. That same love. Preach it. (laughs) What you said, seriously, (laughs) what you said is like, is you were speaking truth. And from the moment you you shared your experience this past winter uh, with Emelina uh, to what you just said about that 
moment of our death where we have to try i mean you know that that is the 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 greek word for the word faith is a synonym for trust and so those two go hand in hand and this is why it's so important to not just settle and to allow shame to define us because if it, it's one thing to to continue to struggle in the doubt that's another thing to give ourselves permission to live in it and while that of course is easier to overcome uh, easier said than done it's something that the lord desires for us like he, he wants us to be close to him as you pointed out so beautifully and um and that is that is the path to that wholeness to that freedom that i know i've talked about before um and if nothing else i think one thing that struck me that you said is you had a choice like you noticed when you were struggling with emelina to go down that path of shame and to condemn yourself because your faith wasn't strong enough or that you know condemning yourself as a mom because you didn't take care of her well enough or whatever it was the, those are the lies and you you identify that you called it out and by naming it by calling it out you are bringing those lies into the light of the lord and it was because of that that the lord gave you that grace it it and of course i mean it, i'm sure the assistance of mary being in the room having that statue having those stars in the ceiling uh, because we look to Mary again as that human, fully human, just like you and me, who is given that grace to be completely immaculate. That in her moments where she experienced the temptation to doubt or the temptation to um, to break away from the Lord, that 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 identity, that that grace, special grace that was given to her, kept her always docile, always united to to god and so we have no more powerful model or witness than her because obviously she suffered obviously she endured and i think this was actually the the theme of uh your pod your Lenten podcast last year the seven sorrows of mary and so obviously she experienced I extreme anguish and was united to christ on the cross i mean she was not spared from that especially as a mom and yet and yet none of those things ever became obstacles for receiving the fullness of grace that she remained in that tension she remained open to the lord and that i mean i didn't say this but that is the consequence of shame and it's, it's the consequence of adam and eve is that they close themselves off to each other they close themselves off to god but there's even a certain closing off to ourself, that there's a, a blindness that a, that we now impose, not always because we don't want to face things, but because of the pain. It's, it's like an instinct. It's like our uh, self-preservation instinct where it's like we, we have to close ourselves off in order to survive. And the Lord wants to remind us that survival is, is not through our own power, our own preservation, but our survival really, and it's really not surviving, it's thriving. Our thriving has to be through the cross, death to resurrection. Yes, our surviving has to be due to the cross. And I love that you say that because I had other memories come up as I was pondering and preparing in my heart for this conversation. And I am definitely the kind of person that tries to like hold it all together and keep it all together. Many of you may know, um, I have a husband, a glorious husband who I love so much. Hi, Brian. You listen to every podcast. I love you so much. He happens to have a rare disease and he hates that I say this. I love you. But he's been sick many times in our marriage. But then we also are an adoptive family and we adopted two of our children older and we, we have special needs in our family and our son, he has significant special needs. He's intellectually disabled and he also is challenged with mental health issues. And so I'm sure you can imagine there was a good 
I don't know, 13 years, let's say that I was, I was really fully dependent on the Lord, but also trying to like control all of these circumstances, control the behaviors of my son for sure, because he was having a very hard time controlling them himself. So I had to learn behavior modification and praise God for all the beautiful souls, all of you out there that do that type of work. It was wonderful and very, very effective until it wasn't meaning this. There were moments that I fell flat on my face in the most beautiful of ways because I had no answers. I had no way of knowing how to move forward other than a complete surrender to the Lord and the Lord's glorious provision every time. One time was when I got a phone call from Henry's school that he was hallucinating and walking off campus. The second time was fast forward three or four years later from middle school to high school, and he ran out of school and threatened to go run in the middle of traffic on the highway. I can't fix these things. I couldn't fix these things. There was nothing that I could do to fix those things in those moments. And those moments touched on my complete and utter dependence on God. And God is so providential and so divine. Father John and I are recording this podcast on the morning where the gospel of Mark has to do with the healing of two women. And the first woman is the woman who's hemorrhaging and she reaches out to Christ. She reaches out to Christ's cloak and touches him and she's healed And Jesus says to her, your faith has saved you. Your faith has saved you. And I love to think that God is so simple. I'm so complicated. We're so complicated, (laughs) but God is so simple and love is so simple and so complete. It's our faith that saves us. It's not our doing. It's not our, our earning. It's our faith. It's our purity of heart and our return time and time again to the Lord. And for me, I have to do that every day and sometimes multiple times a day. It just depends. I am weak in so many ways, yet so held and so secure and so strong in the Lord. So every day I have to be reminded and I have to remind myself. Sometimes I have to reframe my thinking, allow God to reframe my thinking, to reframe my heart, to reframe my soul, to reframe my being that I am God's beloved daughter. I am loved beyond imagination and I am loved beyond compare. And what I mean by that is what you touched on, Father John, about the comparison to others. And I think this is so critical. We all have stories. We all have hurt. We all have pain. We all have shame. No one goes through life without that. So any of us who sit in the pews at church or walk into a coffee shop or walk into a trendy store or turn on the TV to think that everyone doesn't carry that, that's false. That is absolutely false. We're all the same in that way. Every single one of us, no matter how pretty our social media pictures are. That's one thing. The second thing is, is God has poured upon, God has poured out gifts. First, just the gift of who we are as a human that erases all shame because that's not of God. We are all that profoundly valuable, but God has also poured out gifts upon us. And like it says in scripture, we are one body in Christ. We need every gift. You are needed. We are all needed. Father John is needed. I'm needed. You are needed. Your children are needed. Every single one of your family members is needed because we are all different. Not one of us is the same. And what we bring first and foremost is just the gift of self, just as we are doing nothing, that merciful love of God. And then secondly, the gifts that God has blessed us with to love and to share, to heal, 
to commune with one another as God calls us. I don't think I have anything more I can add to that. Uh, perhaps other than what you said about comparison reminds me of a quote. I think it's from Franklin Roosevelt, one of the Roosevelts, that comparison is the thief of joy. And the more we allow ourselves, and it is a choice, you know, we choose, we will, when we focus, and maybe it's because of habit, maybe we're used to it. We focus on those those darker things that, pit us against other people that make us condemn ourself and that distance us from God or give us an image of God uh, that might be rooted in, in a complete lie because of what has befallen us. And perhaps if nothing else, as you just shared with us, Lindy, that the very essence of of who we are as being needed, but and I would also add to that wanted, wanted by the Lord, uh, that whatever we find closed off to him, uh, that in this Lenten season, we ask for the courage. And maybe, maybe it's not even courage we should ask for. We should really be praying for that, like poverty, for that, that, that ability to be weak, that capacity to be weak before the Lord, to not come to him as we sometimes do with this, well, I know what I need to pray about and I know what I need to say before the Lord, but to to perhaps come to him as a child and be like, I really don't know what you want in this time that I have with you, Lord, but let God be God and let us be the children. Amen. Let God be God and let us be the children. And going back to that gospel of Mark, and I want to invite everyone to go read this gospel, Mark chapter five, verses 21 through 43. The second part has to do with, I think, one of the things you just said, Father John, and that God wants us. First, the woman who was hemorrhaging reached out to Jesus, but then Jesus went to the daughter who her whole family thought that she had died. And he said to her, Talitha Kum, rise up, rise up, my daughter, rise up, young girl, rise up. And so I love what Father John said about coming to the Lord in our poverty. If we can think about that little girl for a moment, she had nothing to give in that moment. They thought she had died. And Jesus said, no, she's just asleep but they thought she died. She was doing nothing. And Jesus went to her and said, rise up. So may we be that pure. May we be that open hearted. May we be that humble that we can sit with our Lord in our complete poverty and allow the Lord to reach into us in a way that we maybe even have never experienced before and say, Talitha Kum, rise up. You are so loved. Rise up. And may we know that that's where we can always return to, even if it's every moment of every day, the Lord is always with us in every moment. So thank you. Thank you so much, Father John. You are welcome. And as you also pointed out, you know, I'm, I, I'm so blessed that the Lord has freed me is in so much of my own shame, but in saying that there's always work to be done. And it's amazing that when I started off kind of looking at this stuff, and this really was one of the fruits of being in the seminary. When I started looking at my shame more deeply, <clears throat> that, uh, what was at first painful and almost debilitating still is painful, but is motivated by a greater desire to be free and by a certainty that in giving this shame to the Lord and giving over this insecurity, this lie that I am allowing Christ to penetrate into what is not of him so that he can dwell in me evermore. And that's worth it. That is worth it.
so know of my prayers for all of you in this Lenten season, especially for those of you who might be experiencing that pain, that shame, that resistance to f let God forgive you, that resistance to let you forgive yourself, and know that through this beautiful establishment of the church that Christ has founded, that we are all in this journey together and that we don't stop until we reach our final glory, our eternal glory in heaven. Yes, we will always need the divine physician, the divine healer, always, all of us in our lifetimes. May we never be fooled by that, <laughs> each and every one of us. <laughs> yep. Amen. So as we also continue to journey through the Lenten season and this concept of shame, we all know what is in each one of our hearts and our souls. And there are so many other beautiful souls out there to walk with and accompany us. And the things that I suggest are things that I do myself. And this is the way that God works through and helps to heal me in my own life and also gives me other glorious mentors and role models. So I want to encourage everyone to go to reconciliation and may we all remember that nothing is too great. Nothing. Somebody may be listening right now and thinking, no, I can't go there. It's too big. It's too great. Nothing, absolutely nothing is too great for our Lord to heal. Absolutely nothing. So I want to encourage reconciliation. Also counseling, pastoral counseling. There are a lot of faith-filled, glorious counselors out there in the world for you to sit with and to work things through, spiritual direction as well. And then just all of the glorious sacraments, prayer opportunities, Bible studies, faith sharings to really walk with and journey and accompany one another. We never know when and how the Lord is going to heal us. My spiritual director, director was just encouraging me to be open to the surprises of the Lord, the surprises of the Lord. That's so beautiful and so true. Just like those stars on my daughter's ceiling and the glow in the dark Mary, because I am a beloved daughter of the Lord, just like my seven-year-old. You are a beloved daughter and son or son of the Lord, just like our children, these beautiful children that we see running around us. So may we always remember that. And please share, please share Mamas in Spirit with others. And this is not to get numbers for Mamas in Spirit. This is not to grow. I have no goals for Mamas in Spirit. When I created this, this is grassroots, everybody. <laughs> and this is not to grow mamas in spirit. This is to share the love of the Lord. So if there's something in this podcast and there's someone in your life that you think that it could help to touch someone's heart so they could open their heart more fully to the Lord for healing, please share this podcast. Please share mamas in spirit. You can connect on Instagram and Facebook, but if you're off social me media, fantastic for you. You can also go to mamas and and many, many places that you can find podcasts to listen to many more faithful podcasts. And I just want to point out one podcast to you, season two, episode six with Christine Rich, Beautiful You. I remember Christine in the very opening, I put to music, this quote that she said, this little blurb where she was talking about her daughters and one of her daughters was comparing herself to her other daughter. And she was crying saying, but God made you as you are and you are so beautiful. And so I just, that's on my heart to share that podcast with you because that may be a message that you or someone you love needs to hear today. So I want to thank you so much for being with us. You enrich my life. You enrich Father John's life. You, you enrich our lives just by being with us. You are a gift and we can't wait to be together again. This is Lindy Wynn with Mamas in Spirit. May God bless you and yours always.